from St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. I mean, I think what happens uh, through the 19th century and into the early 20th is that racial restrictions are often implicit. They're enforced by community standards, by violence, by intimidation, um, or simply by other forms of segregation. So all of St. Louis's infamous private streets, for example, were understood to be uh, effective mechanisms of segregation. The other two times it was overturned. So he, he was unsure if, and he didn't know if it was even worth their time. He even told, I remember he said he told grandma, he said, I don't know if this is worth our time. Do you think this is worth our time? I'm Sarah Fenske. 73 years ago today, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down racially restrictive housing covenants. The case was called Shelley versus Kramer, and it pitted against each other two families in St. Louis, one black, one white. In 1945, the black family, J.D. and Ethel Shelley, bought a modest brick house just north of St. Louis Avenue in the Greater Ville neighborhood. They had eight kids living with them, and they needed the space, as their grandson Lawrence C. Riley Jr. and great-great-granddaughter Monica Beckham Holmes later recalled on the We Live Here podcast. Initially, they were looking for, when they originally, they were looking for housing mm-hmm. in, a, in, the seg- in the segregated areas. Area. Mm-hmm. But it was so crowded, they couldn't find anything accommodating to their needs. It was more or less, where can I give my kids a good opportunity right. to grow up in a good, nice neighborhood where they have better opportunities? And that's what it was with them. I can remember my grandmother telling me that um, when they got the house, she thanked God for blessing them. And she was so, so excited. It was really good memories for them all. It was a predominantly white area. Mm -hmm. And they knew that there could be possible Mm -hmm. problems coming with them purchasing that particular property. And problems there were. The house was subject to a covenant that's basically a binding legal agreement that said homeowners couldn't sell the property to non-white people. After the Shelleys moved in, a white white neighbor named Louis Kramer sued to enforce the covenant. Now, Kramer lost, and that changed American history. No longer were such covenants legal or enforceable. Our grandparents did have the capability to purchase that particular property. Mm -hmm. So it came down to that. If you can afford to buy it, Mm -hmm. you can own it. He did not think for one minute, even though he was faithful, Mm -hmm. he had that human doubt, right? Mm -hmm. Because they initially won. The other two times, it was overturned. Mm -hmm. So he, he was unsure if... And he didn't know if it was even worth their time. He even told, I remember he said, he told grandma. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't know if this is worth our time. Do you think this is worth our time? And she said, yeah, it's worth our time because if we win, we get to stay here and Mm -hmm. raise the kids. In May, they actually did the ruling. On May the 3rd, Mm -hmm. a telegram came. That's how they got the information. It went, it went, actually went to both attorneys. And then that's when uh, George Vaughn gave the information to, to our grandparents. He said he was just thrown, and, 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 him and him and my grandma hugged and kissed, and they shouted, and they went and told everybody, you know, it was more or less, we had won, right? We had won. We, over, we overcame what we didn't think we could. Totally excited because they knew how many doors this whole decision had opened. And that is the grandson of J.D. and Ethel Shelley speaking on an episode of the We Live Here podcast in 2018. The U.S. Supreme Court released its decision 73 years ago today. And yet, the true scope of racially restricted covenants in St. Louis is only now coming into focus. And that's thanks to a new paper by Colin Gordon published this year in the Journal of Urban History. Colin Gordon is a history professor at the University of Iowa. He's also the author of Citizen Brown, Race, Democracy, and 
inequality in the St. Louis suburbs, as well as mapping decline, St. Louis and the fate of the American city. And he joins us today. Colin, welcome back. Good to be here. So, Colin, in this paper, you write that, quote, while the importance and impact of racial covenants is widely recognized, we know relatively little about their adoption, diffusion, or consequences in any given setting. Why is that? Well, it's uh, the principal reason is the the way in which the records are kept and the way in which they're stored. Um, These restrictive agreements... uh, are attached to property records. Mm -hmm. And so they're, uh, you know, part of the provenance of county recorder's offices. Mm -hmm. And county recorder's offices uh, keep their records quite literally in the order that people walk in the door. So I could walk in and say, I'm releasing a sewer lien, I'm selling my house, you know, I have a property dispute with my neighbor, and that's the order in which the documents are collected. Mm -hmm. And then they're bound in great books of what, for most of the first half of the 20th century, handwritten uh, eight by 11 ledgers uh, running into the millions of pages. Hmm. And so unless there were legal disputes like the Shelley case, it was almost impossible to know where these restrictions were and what their coverage was. So your new study represents a leap forward for our knowledge of these in the St. Louis area. How were you able to get access to this information? This wasn't a matter of going back over millions and millions of pages. Uh, What gave you the shortcut here? Well, it's a a good question. So uh, this is a collaborative uh, project that I'm doing with colleagues at uh, Legal Services of Eastern Missouri uh, and EHOC in St. Louis. And we were interested in replicating the work that's been done in Minneapolis Mm -hmm. by the Mapping Prejudice Project, where they were able to get digital copies of all of the deeds and basically do a sort of distant reading computer search of their language. Now, we weren't able to do that in St. Louis, partly because the records aren't digitized Mm -hmm. and partly because well into the 1940s, many of them are still handwritten Mm -hmm. and so they're unsearchable even if they were digitized. But in the course of of muddling through this, uh, my colleague Peter Hoffman at uh, Legal Services uh, discovered uh, in the possession of one of the big uh, title and abstract firms, a catalog of restrictions. So the uh, title firm, which of course has to assemble a title abstract every time a property changes hand, decided to keep their own record of all of the restrictions on property. So we were able to use that as an index for the recorder's files. And this was um, this was a broad swath of files, everything this title company had handled in, in a certain span? Um, yeah, it was an index of all of the restrictions, not all of which were racial, because particularly early in the 20th century, it was very common to have private restrictions that did the work that is now done by building permits and zoning you know, specifying things about your fences and your house color and that sort of thing. But the title companies, again, uh, kept a pretty rigorous uh, record of this because it saved them from diving in to the morass of recorder's records every time they had to process a new transaction. Hmm. So you were able to get at these, and once you were able to get at them, you were able to sort them. Um, So you found 1,941 restrictive covenants here in the city. Um, 43% of those were racial. And it was interesting to find out how that was something that, that it wasn't going back to the 1800s. That was something that came much more into play after the year 1900. What, What do you understand about why that was? Yeah, the timing of these is very interesting. I I mean, I think what happens uh, through the 19th century and into the early 20th is that racial restrictions are often implicit. Um, That is, they're enforced by community standards, by violence, by intimidation, Mm. um, or simply by uh, um, other forms of segregation. So all of St. Louis's infamous private streets, for example, were understood to be... uh, effective mechanisms of segregation, even if they weren't, uh, that wasn't written into the original agreements. But what happens uh, later in the, uh, as you approach the sort of World War uh, One era, is a couple things. One is that the Great Migration uh, from the South begins to pick up steam, uh, particularly as the economy booms for World War One. Mm-hmm. Secondly, a number of cities, St. Louis included, pass explicit racial zoning ordinances. In the case of St. Louis is in 1916. 
and the Supreme Court outlaws these in 1917. So the combination of the threat posed by the Great Migration and the closing of that um, other mechanism of actual zoning by race pushed realtors, homeowners, and developers towards this mechanism. Hmm. And they really talk, take off in St. Louis in the 1920s. And so the Supreme Court said you can't zone by race, but at that point they were silent or they were okay with these sort of individual covenants just being attached to specific properties. Yeah, the, the assessment of state courts, so there's a Missouri case, uh, Kohler v. Roland in 1918, and then there's a Supreme Court case, Corrigan v. Buckley in 1926, which basically hold that these are private contracts, mm. and two individuals can decide on whatever they want in a private contract. And uh, the fact that that contract might go to, go to court and be enforced doesn't constitute state action that is subject to the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. Okay. So that was the understanding and what, at the time, and, and these things right. went, uh, they took off from there. Right. And so what Shelley did is it is it Shelley finally tipped that and said, no, enforcement of such a contract is state action. Hmm. But it's important to recognize that that's all that Shelley outlawed. The contracts themselves were still legal. There was just no longer an enforcement mechanism. Hmm. Although, you know, people tried to find other enforcement mechanisms after Shelley. And so with these restrictive covenants, um, were they specifically barring, the ones you saw in St. Louis as, as you were searching through this database, did they bar sales to African Americans? Did they make it all people of color? What kind of language were they using? Um, it's, a, it's a good question because I've looked at these in a number of cities, and you do see quite a bit of variation in the language. Hmm. And part of that variation is regional. So on the West Coast, they're anti-Asian. In some of the Northeast, they're anti-Semitic. Um, they're almost always uh, anti-Black. Mm -hmm. And the, the language changes over time. So very early in the 20th century, you often get, you know, given the understanding of race at the time, a long laundry list of no Mongolians, no Ethiopians, no Bulgarians, no Italians. Mm -hmm. But that increasingly contracts to being to just the term Caucasian. Um, now, St. Louis is an interesting case of this because there's very little variation in the language. So of over 700 agreements that we looked at, almost all of them use the term Caucasian race. Hmm. And that's because over 500 of those agreements were drawn up by the same entity, the St. Louis Real Estate Exchange. They had a template restriction agreement and the um, the phrasing and the terminology was became standardized. We're talking today to Colin Gordon. He's a history professor at the University of Iowa, um, and he has looked deeply into the use of racial, racially restricted covenants here in St. Louis. This new research just has so many fascinating details in it. Colin, where in the city did you find these kind of covenants being deployed? Um, so in St. Louis, there's... Uh, really two dominant areas of uh, restriction, maybe maybe three. Uh, the first and the earliest would be the, the sort of private streets uh, you know, around Forest Park and in the, and the West End, mm -hmm. some of which contain uh, racial restrictions, but most of which do not. Um, and then there are basically two dominant types of restriction in St. Louis, one of which is a subdivision-based restriction, which is imposed by the developer at the time the property is built. And this would cover 200, 300, as much as 1,300 uh, houses at the same time. Hmm. And these would typically be accompanied by a long list of restrictions of what you could and could not do with your property. That, and those were mostly in southwest St. Louis, which was being developed uh, at precisely this time. Mm -hmm. But just as, as prominently were the profusion of... Um, uh, petition-based restrictions that were assembled door-to-door -door in older neighborhoods, particularly on the borders of the Ville, which were seen to be at threat of racial transition hmm. um, after, after the uh, first mig Great Migration and running all the way into the second in the 1940s. You had a great phrase in your study. You said that um, these petition-based covenants on the north side, the spread of them was, quote, frantic and defensive. These were people who were worried that their neighborhood might be taken over by somebody who doesn't look like them. 
Yeah, that's that's a good characterization. And um, so as the Great Migration uh, sort of uh, picked up steam, one of the concerns of the realtors particularly was to con was to seal the borders of the Ville. And so these restrictions are assembled bit by bit, uh, south of the Ville, creating the Del Mar Divide, uh, northeast and west of the Ville as well, in an effort to sort of stop that spread. Hmm. And what's interesting uh, in this story, um, particularly since you know we're, we're spurred by the Shelley versus Kramer case today, is that almost all of the legal disputes involving restrictive covenants before Shelley versus Kramer were suits brought by white homeowners who wanted out from under agreements that their parents had signed. Hmm. So particularly in these transitional neighborhoods, you often had um, these restrictions were not necessarily uh, particularly successful. And many of them failed over time. And so there were uh, challenges by, again, by white homeowners who said, look, I, everyone else is leaving for the county and I want to leave too. Uh, but I can't sell my house. Hmm. So this was less a, a principled stand on the part of these white homeowners. This was more like, let me out. Uh, Shelley versus Kramer really p put the nail in the heart of this one. How did the real estate industry respond to that? It sounds like through that St. Louis real estate exchange, they were they were actively supporting all this. Yeah. So the the, the St. Louis real estate exchange was not, not only supported, it was actually, it was a party, a third party to to about 500 of these agreements. Hmm. That is, they assembled the agreement, they hired people to go door to door and sign it. And if someone violated the agreement, it was the real estate exchange that brought suit in almost all the cases. Hmm. Um, because as I had mentioned earlier, sometimes the white homeowners were lukewarm about enforcing the restriction because of course it restrained their property rights in fundamental ways. And if they wanted to sell, uh, you know, it affected the value of their property. But it was, you know, as I characterize it, a very sort of frantic and piecemeal kind of uh, procedure. And a lot of times these agreements failed just because they weren't very well executed. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, the, um, the recollection of the Shelley case that we heard at the top end. Uh, so the first Shelley case in the circuit court of St. Louis, it's held that the restriction, the restriction is overturned. But it's not overturned on equal protection grounds. It's overturned because the court simply says it failed. There are there were already other black families living on the street. Therefore, we won't uphold the restriction because uh, it's you know it's 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 invalid because of its failure. Hmm. Or restrictions thrown out because they didn't have enough signatures, or the signatures were could not be verified, or they didn't have enough signatures from the homeowners on the street. All these sorts of um, uh, sort of deficiencies in the contract uh, were were prominent early on. Hmm. This is such interesting history here, and it was so fascinating to read these details in your paper. You end your paper by talking about the impact of these, and ultimately, you write they were important quote when they worked, but also when they failed. What do you mean by that? Well, so what we see with the Shelley uh, case uh, is that once the agreements become unenforceable, they simply, in a sense, sort of mutate into other forms. And so, first of all, the, they, they create the idea and sustain the idea that African-American occupancy is a nuisance use of property that threatens its value. Mm. And that is not wiped out by Shelley. And that continues to be a standard element in private appraisal forms for realtors in the St. Louis area and elsewhere. It informs the uh, federal government's redlining of St. Louis neighborhoods in the 1930s and 1940s. Mm -hmm. And the much of the incorporation and annexation and zoning of St. Louis County is a response to Shelley versus Kramer. Hmm. So we see this flurry of new municipalities formed in the late 1940s, early 1950s, precisely because they want to use land use zoning, municipal land use zoning, um, in lieu of racially restrictive governance. Hmm. So, so much of the history of this region goes back to this. Well, it's it's such an interesting topic, and I understand your work on this is not done, not at all. You're actually going to be temporarily moving here, uh, maybe late summer, to continue this research. What's your plan for the next phase? So, our, our intention all along was to do uh, both the city of St. Louis and St. Louis County. Uh, and the in the county... 
Uh, it's a much more elaborate and sort of larger scale project of um, tracking these restrictions down through individual subdivisions. Um, you know, St. Louis County has upwards of 9,000 subdivisions. Mm -hmm. And it's very sort of labor intensive to wade through these records because, we, again, we have the similar kind of um, first order index. We have a card catalog at, the, at St. Louis County of all of the restrictions. But it doesn't say whether they're racial restrictions or not. So we have to pull the document, look for the racial restriction, record it, map it, and move on. And so my hope is um, in, in the fall to pick up where we had been just before the pandemic hit, which was launching a sort of community-engaged research project in the records of St. Louis County. Hmm. Well, Colin Gordon, this sounds like really interesting work. I hope you will come back um, as that project gets off the ground and as you begin to dig into the county's use. We'd love an update on this. I'd be happy to come back. Thanks, Sarah. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Colin Gordon is a history professor at the University of Iowa, and this new research is in the Journal of Urban History. Now, we've been discussing Shelley versus Kramer. That's the landmark case that pitted a white St. Louis man against a black St. Louis family. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on that 73 years ago to this day. And now we're joined here by St. Louis Public Radio reporter Corinne Ruff. Uh, like Colin, she's also doing some research into this subject. Corinne, welcome. Hey, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So, Corinne, I understand you're planning to dig into these covenants a bit yourself. What are you looking for? Yeah, so I mean, it was great to hear Colin talk about his research because what he's done is, um, you know, really find sort of a, a, a way to get through these documents. I mean, as you said, there's just millions of documents talking about these covenants. Um, and he was able to really quantify how many, where they are across the city. And what I'm really looking to do is unearth the stories from people living in homes with covenants. Um, you know, many people might not even know that their house was, was part of this and still to this day has a restriction uh, you know, uh, associated with the deed and the subdivision that they live in. And so I'm, I'm really, you know, in my reporting, looking to talk to people, you know, do they know about this? Have, has their family ever talked about this in the past? Um, when did they f first hear about it? What do they think about it? And, you know, maybe more importantly, have they ever tried doing anything about it? Um, I've spoken with some people who've said it, it can be really challenging to remove or add a document that clarifies that these covenants are illegal. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can be pretty costly. And many times people need the help of a real estate attorney. So it, it can be kind of a challenging process. But I'm very interested in talking to anyone who has gone through it or is, is you know, trying to figure out what could be done. So Corinne, if anybody has taken this on, and, and this is something that, that resonates with them, how would you want them to follow up so that uh, you could learn more? Yeah, absolutely. So the thing that I would suggest is you know, looking through your property records, seeing if they make any kind of reference to restrictions of any kind, um, a covenant, whether it's racial or otherwise. Um, and then, you know, get in touch, reach out. Um, they can get in touch with me by email. Um, I'll be putting up, uh, putting together a little how-to article with more details about, you know, what it looks like to try to find these documents, what kind of language you might be looking for. Um, it can be kind of tricky. You might, you might even need to take a little trip down to the, the, the city's recorder of deeds office to really go back to these documents that tie back to like the, the late 40s. Um, but I would say, yeah, just, just reach out. If, if you feel like you've got a story, you know that your family house or the house that you live in might be a part of one of these covenants, um, you know, I'd love to talk to you for a story. Well, if you're listening and, and that's something you'd like to do, we encourage you to follow up with Corinne. We'll get information about how to do that on our website, stlpr.org. Um, and, and we can also get that information on our social media. That's at STL on air is our Twitter account. We have a Facebook group too, which you can and should join. Uh, so St. Louis Public Radio reporter Corinne Ruff, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Thanks so much, Sarah. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here.
If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.